The Unity input system has been a constant source of confusion for many reasons. When it was first introduced, there were no clear established workflows and people mostly used the age-old system design strategy of winging it. But over time, Unity's added more features and streamlined the APIs into something a bit more cohesive and with more options. In a nutshell, there are three main workflows for using the input system. And today we're going to use the APIs for all three in the context of moving this character around so that you can make informed decisions about what is best for your project. Let's get started. All right, the first thing I want to talk about today are the controls I have here on the screen. I think a lot of people are unaware that Unity's input system comes with several on-screen controls. With these, you can create little UI widgets that the users can interact with on the screen. I'm sure you've seen stick and button widgets before on touch screens that emulate a gamepad. Out of the box, the input system comes with two types, buttons and sticks. Here you can see I've got an image with the on-screen stick component on it, and I've configured this up to emulate the left stick of a gamepad. You could create your own custom controls by extending the base on-screen control class. Let's take a quick look at one of the buttons. Here I'm using the on-screen button component and I've configured it up to button south. So just by way of example here, let's hit play. You'll see if I start using the left stick widget, it's going to start behaving just as if it was the left stick of a gamepad. Right now I've got the camera locked to the player's position. So you can see I can move the stick around and it's moving my character relative to the camera. Similarly, I can press the X button and it's going to cause my character to jump. Now, one more thing before we start looking at code, I want to talk about the visualizations. So another nice feature that comes with the Unity input system, if you go into the samples, the very last sample that comes with the samples package is a set of visualizers. And these are prefabs you can just drop into your scene and immediately start getting visual feedback about what's happening with your input device. So this works great for all kinds of controls and there are several prefabs in there that you can use just by dropping them into your scene or you can use the scripts that come with it to build your own. So today we're going to use these on-screen controls and the visualizer to help us understand what's going on with the three main workflows around using the input system. So let's jump over to code. Just a reminder that if you want a discount on your Rider personal license, there's a 25% discount code on Discord in the channel announcements section, which is meant for YouTube channel subscribers. The Discord is an excellent place to go if you want to improve your skills. It's full of all kinds of people of all skill levels. Now let's take a look at this code. I've started to write a simple player controller. There's a few serialized fields for things like jump force and move speed, a reference to my model, a few events we can fire when we jump or land, and I'm going to cache a reference to our main camera. I'm also going to have a vector 2 where I can store the value of our left stick input. For simplicity's sake, we can also consider that to be our movement velocity, and I can have a public method for other components to be able to retrieve that. Then let's have a simple start method where I cache the camera, and then we'll go right into building our update method. The first and most naive way of using the input system is by directly reading device states. This is the simplest but least flexible workflow. So we can get a reference to the current gamepad, likewise current keyboard, current mouse, or current touch screen, and there's a few other types as well. We'll focus on the gamepad API for now, but all of these inherit from the input device base class, so they're all very similar. Let's have a guard clause on our gamepad to make sure it's not null. Now we can directly read the values from the gamepad by referencing the device's controls and reading the values they're currently generating. Just as gamepad is an extension of an input device, here left stick is an extension of an input control. So we can directly read the value of the left stick and store it into our move input field. In this example, I want to be moving the player relative to the camera direction. So let's get the camera's forward direction with a y of 0, and we'll get the camera's right direction also with a y of 0. Then we can combine those values with our vector2 input. The width extension method is part of our Unity Utilities library. I'll put a link for that on the screen. This calculation is really separate from reading the input, so let's refactor this into its own method. I'll bring up the Refactor Context menu and choose Extract Method. I'm going to give this a useful name, let's say Calculate Movement Direction, and I'll set the return type to be a local variable direction. There we go. Now, down in our new method, we don't really need to have a local version of the direction variable. Let's just return the calculation directly by using the refactor again and choosing inline variable. So now we know the direction we want to move in. Let's say as long as it has a square magnitude of greater than 0.01, first we'll rotate the model to face that direction, and then we'll update the position of this transform by that direction multiplied by time.delta time times our movement speed. 
That's a very simple way of doing movement and it's bound to get more complex. So let's refactor that into its own method. I'm gonna call it move and we'll just take in one input, which will be our calculated direction. Similar to our previous method, we don't really need to store a local variable of the direction. Let's just pass the result of our calculate movement direction right into our move method. Now let's handle our jump input. Here we can directly read from the cross button input control. The button controls have a property was press this frame. So if we've pressed the button this frame, let's call our existing jump method. There are a few different conventions for accessing the different buttons. For example, cross button is the same thing as calling button south. So in a nutshell, that's what's considered to be the lowest level of using the input system. It's very basic. It totally bypasses the input actions editor and you don't benefit from any of the features that come with that, but it can be useful if you just need a very simple or quick implementation of one kind of device or maybe two devices, but it's generally not the best choice if you wanna handle multiple kinds of input or you wanna target multiple platforms. So let's graduate up one level to use input actions and the player input component. Just before we look at actions, I'm gonna press play and make sure that our code is working as expected. So yeah, we can move around. It's reading the left stick, no problem. And let's try jumping. Yeah, all is good. The visualizer is showing everything correctly. Let's move on to actions. If we come up under project settings and input system package, here you can define an asset that will store all the information about your actions and their bindings. I find setting up actions and bindings to be extremely tedious, so I keep a basic set of actions in a Unity package that I import at the start of every new project. If I ping that, you can see that here in my settings folder, but also you can see here the default one that comes with the input system, which is also a good starting point. Now this video isn't really about creating actions and bindings because there's a thousand videos on YouTube about how to do that. We're going to focus on how we can use this information in code. And one of the biggest questions is, do I need to generate this C-sharp class? Well, in the workflow that we're about to explore, the answer is no. The generated C-sharp class is an alternative to the player input component. Using the player input component along with actions is the highest level of abstraction you can get out of the box from the input system. Let's call it the low code method. Let's come over to my player game object and I'll add the player input component to it. You can see it fills out my actions already to be my player input actions. The other important setting here is behavior. There's four types you can choose from. The first one uses the gameObject.SendMessage method. So you can use that to receive messages on this game object. Broadcast messages will broadcast that message down the game object hierarchy. Invoking Unity events is going to give you a new events fold out and you can trigger different events that way. There's some basic top level ones, but you can see there's a fold out for each of my action maps as well. So if I expand player, you can see I've got the move, look, fire, actions, and so on. Your fourth option is to invoke C sharp events instead of Unity events. So it works basically the same way, except you're going to register for the events in code. Let's quickly look at how we would implement this with Unity events. Well, let's start by stripping out everything that we don't need from before because we're not going to directly read values from any of the input devices. We'll remove everything except for our move method, which is independent of how we're getting the input. Then we just need to make a few methods that match the signature that the Unity event is looking for. So that means we need methods that take in a callback context. Through the context object, we can read values just like we were doing before. You can get all kinds of other information from the context. For example, if we make another method here to handle our jump that takes in a context, we can check to see if the action has been performed. If so, we're gonna call our jump method. Every action has a set of phases that it goes through in response to receiving input, and I know this is a point of confusion. Started, performed, and canceled are the primary input action phases that you need to know about. Started is when the action begins, such as when a button is first pressed or a control moves away from its default state. Performed is when the action completes successfully, like a button press crosses the threshold or a value changes in a meaningful way. Cancelled is when the action stops. If you're building something simple, instead of checking performed, what you could also do is reference the action itself was pressed this frame. Now let's jump back to Unity and hook up our Unity events. Just going to address two quick gotchas before we get there. When you're working with input actions, make sure that you assign them to a control scheme, especially if you're working with those UI controls. So for example, make sure that your button for the gamepad is actually part of your gamepad scheme. And likewise with your keyboard should be part of your keyboard and mouse scheme. Another problem I've seen people have is they start to experience a lot of jitter when using these UI controls and they've switched to use events. You can go to your UI control stick component 
check the box for Use Isolated Input Actions. This makes sure that the input system is only responding to the device that you've set here in the component and not the device that actually owns the pointer, like your mouse. Now let's come over to the player game object and we'll come down to our player input and we'll start setting up these Unity events. So it'll give us a little bit of room and I'll expand the events. And the first event under player is move. So let's add an event here. I'll just drag this same component in here and we're going to reference the player controller. Right up at the top, we see two methods that match the signature. We'll select move. That's good. We'll scroll down a little bit. Jump is here at the bottom. Let's add an event here. Again, I'll drag reference to this component in and we'll grab that method. It's right up at the top. Jump. That's all we have to do. Let's press play and make sure that it works. Let's try movement first. So just drag the stick a little bit. That looks good. Nice and smooth. Can't complain about that. And then I can use the cross button. Yeah, we can jump no problem. And the nice thing about this is now that we're using the actions, my keyboard scheme also works. So if I start pressing left and right or back and forward on the keyboard, that will also move my character. Now, what happens if you want to use the player input component, but you want to use C sharp events and not Unity events? To do this, we're going to need a reference to the player input component. Let's change start to be a statement body method, and then we can grab a reference to it here just with get component. Once we have a reference to the component, we can subscribe to its on action triggered event. We'll make a special method to handle that. Like the other ones, it takes in a callback context. Now we can just have a switch statement on the action's name. So for example, if it's the move action, we're going to do exactly the same thing we did in the Unity event. Just read in and store the value. If it's the jump action, again, exactly the same thing we did in the Unity event. Now, alternatively here, again, you could use was press this frame. Just keep in mind, these two things aren't exactly the same. Was press this frame means exactly what it sounds like. Context.performed only fires when the action is actually complete. So if inside of your input actions, you've specified some sort of delay or you've set the button press time to be maybe half a second, the event is not considered performed until you've actually held the button for that length of time. A very subtle but important distinction. Okay, quick sanity check. Let's just make sure that everything's working correctly here. The gamepad cross button, no problem. And the left stick, no problem. Looks good. Run around with the keyboard, no problem. The last thing I'm going to say about using the player input system is that it's really great if you're making a split screen multiplayer game. It has all the built in stuff you need to be able to assign different control schemes to local players. You can read all about that and the player input manager component in the documentation. There's also a simple multiplayer sample that comes with the input system. But let's leave the player input component behind and move on to the third workflow you can use to implement the input system. This is where we're going to have the most control. And this is also where you need to have this checkbox checked here where it says generate C sharp class. The class that it generates itself is quite large, but most of it is just configuration. Let's go have a look. Recall that in my input actions, I had two maps. One was for my player actions and I just called it player. The other one I called UI. You can see that this class has generated two interfaces here right at the very bottom. One is called iPlayerActions, and that represents all the actions in the player map. The other one is called iUIActions, represents all the actions in the UI map. Not only is this going to give us a lot of flexibility, it also gives us a type safe way to access all of these actions. All we have to do is implement concrete versions of these interfaces. So in today's video, we'll just worry about the player actions. Let's start with a new file. I'll call it input reader. Let's add one using static directive here so that we don't have to prefix any static members of the player input actions class using the class name. I'm going to declare one more interface that I want to implement for all of my input readers. I want them all to have a direction property and I want them all to have a method that allows me to turn them on. In the future, we might want a disable as well. So let's define our class input reader. You could make this a mono behavior, but I find it's a lot easier to have it as a scriptable object, which makes it completely scene independent. Not only do we want it to extend scriptable object, but we want to implement the iInput reader interface and the iPlayer actions interface from our generated C -sharp class. I'm going to quickly use writer to implement all the missing members here, since there's quite a few and they're all required. Now through the power of editing, I'll move all the important stuff up to the top. Let's start by declaring some events we can subscribe to. We could have a public event for any time we move. We could also have one for any time we jump. And those events can send back a vector two or a Boolean. 
Next, we're going to have to instantiate and store a reference to that player input actions class that we generated. We could also set up some properties. So here, instead of just having a plain getter for direction, let's actually call the input actions.player.move read value. Essentially, we're just polling the value. We can do exactly the same thing to determine whether or not the jump key is being pressed down. Sometimes polling these values can be more convenient than reacting to events. If we come down to the enable player actions method, let's check to see if input actions is null. If it is, let's instantiate a new version of the player input actions. Then we're going to call the players method set callbacks. We're going to pass in this class because this class implements iPlayer actions. This will connect up all of these methods that we're about to implement. Finally, let's call input actions dot enable. Notice that we're taking in a callback context as an argument to all of these next methods. Since we've already defined a unity action of type vector2 called move, we can just invoke it and pass in the value of that context. In on jump, we could do something similar. Maybe we could have a switch on the context phase. So we could say, if it's started, let's invoke our jump unity action with a value of true. And let's say as soon as it's been canceled, we'll pass in a value of false. These two callbacks we've just filled out are just publishing events. It's not really any different than the polling mechanisms we just did above using the properties. This will give any callers the flexibilities to use the properties or use events. Now, if we come back over to the player controller, let's get a reference to an input reader asset. Now, suppose we want to use the events and not the properties. What we could do is subscribe to inputs move event. This will let us update our move input value every time that event fires. Likewise, we could subscribe to the jump event. If it returns true, meaning the button was pressed, we can execute our jump method. If it was false, we can do whatever we need to do to land the character. And one last very important thing, let's make sure we enable those input actions. Personally, I think I prefer using the properties sometimes, but either way, very convenient. Maybe we should make sure that it actually works. Let's go back to Unity. So I've gone ahead and made an input reader asset. All we have to do is drag that reference into my player controller and press play. Let's try it out. So let's do the buttons first. Yeah, the left stick is working good. Really good, actually. Let's try jumping. No problem. OK, that's awesome. Keyboard. Yep. Jumping. Yeah. OK, perfect. Having this little stick on the screen is actually quite convenient for testing. I think I might have to add a few of these into my usual player input actions import. Anyway, we've covered a lot of ground today, so I hope that for some of you that were struggling with understanding these different workflows, it demystified things a little bit, and you'll be able to make better choices of how you want to go about implementing the input system in your projects. Again, don't forget to join us on Discord if you're so inclined. There's lots of interesting things going on there all the time. And of course, subscribe to the channel. We've got new videos every Sunday. Until then, I'll put something else up on the screen of interest. Maybe I'll see you there.